thank you for the introduction, Kate, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'd just like to say it's four in the morning here in Bali. Uh, still doing some of the uh, humanitarian work in Indonesia while we move on to full time onto this new program. Um, so you might hear some chickens in the background <laughs> come 5.30, um, but we'll, what we're going to do is talk for uh, a presentation and then we'll take questions and answers. And um, congratulations on your uh, Dementia Alliance International and I'm, I'm already learning lots from you. So looking forward to learning much more about uh, how, you know, the best approach to this. I'll share my screen now. Hopefully technology will allow us. Here we go. So it looks like technology is helping so far. So yes, look, I want to acknowledge my partner, Mickey, who's been, um, who's trained as well as with Dale Bredesen. She's a nutritionist and a expert in behavior change. And um, she's really responsible also for making these slides a little bit more attractive than I had initiated. Um, we'll talk about the so as we talked about and uh, in the webinar, so these are the learning objectives. And we're gonna use cases, real people uh, who have improved. And the protocols are called the Bredesen Protocols after Professor Dale Bredesen. And we, we need to address the challenges that we're facing. And collectively as a group uh, moving forward, we're going to have lots of opportunities to overcome these challenges. Um, and they're many and they're varied, but all of them, I believe, are, uh, we can overcome. Now, look, this is a picture of Dale, a lovely human being. And I first was introduced to Dale when both my parents uh, were diagnosed with dementia. One, my mother has Alzheimer's and my father has vascular dementia. And I was studying functional medicine, which is the, you know, we call it the medicine of the 21st century. Um, it's really trying to underline look at a systems approach at underlying the issues of chronic disease rather than a more um, sort of what we call allopathic linear, you know, you go to your doctor, you get diagnosed, you get a drug and you go home kind of thing. So um, I was already very interested and I saw this paper of Dale's and I immediately emailed uh, him and he jokes now with me, he says, apologize, it took him a year to get back to me. But um, this is extraordinary, I thought, that this was extraordinary that he documented the first cases of reversal. So Dale's a professor, um, a neuroscientist, very uh, highly regarded. He's published over 200 papers and he's been studying why brain cells die for almost 30 years. He studied in the laboratories of several Nobel laureates and really he's, he's at the top of his game. So, um, you know, when he publishes something like this, this, for those of us who understand how functional medicine can work, we really take note of this. He's now published, if you go online, you can get his 2016 paper, uh, again, which describes much more the hard data, the improvement in cognitive scores, the changes in brain uh, volumes. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, so at the heart of the Bredesen Protocol, Dale describes these perturbations, things that disturb the brain plasticity, the ability of brain cells to grow and to come together and to function. And um, the analogy is the holes in the roof. And this is why in the last 10 years, 240 drug trials at the cost of one to two billion each trial has failed, with the exception perhaps of Aricept and one or two um, which do minor things because a drug will only ever plug one hole, but the problem still exists. Of course, the rain still gets in. Dale thinks there's actually going to be about 80 holes, but um, eventually through the science, but this is enough to get results. So that's the kind of analogy, if you can think of that as we move through this seminar. Now, I'm not going to go through all these, but I just put them up um, just so that it, we understand how this works because any theoretical model that would explain what Alzheimer's is due to would have to explain why all of these such varied risk factors, how they impact a brain cell to cause Alzheimer's. And this is one of Dale's really original works, but a lot of neuroscientists are agreeing with this now. So, 
his theoretical model is based around this guy here. And we've got to see this as a switch. And we'll show you a video of this soon. But it's called the APP protein molecule. Uh, it's this thing um, sits here and it acts as a switch. This is sitting on the brain cell wall of every, um, every brain cell. And it has two options. It can go to the left like that. And this becomes, uh, this is the healthy way, and that causes brain cells to come together. Or it could be divided into four peptides and it go to the right, and that pulls brain cells apart. And you can see that there's one there called AB, that's the amyloid beta. That is a peptide that looks like it causes a signaling to the brain to the laying down of these plaques and tangles, which is understood to be the underlying pathology when we look at the brains of people with Alzheimer's. So this is the sort of some very simplistic and there's a lot more to learn about it, but this is the simplistic model, this basic switch that can go to brain cells pulling apart called uh, cyanoclasty or brain cells coming together, cyanoblasty. Now by doing a lot of, a lot of tests and underlying all understanding all these holes in the roof, Dale has been able to describe subtypes of Alzheimer's. And those of us who are the first practitioners to train with Dale, we can confirm we're seeing similar patterns occurring. The benefits of this is by subtyping Alzheimer's, we can create a more personalized and targeted approach, which we believe uh, are more effective. So the first type is this inflammatory type one. You see their inflammatory markers. I'll show you a case of that. The second type is what we call a cold or atrophic. Trophic means supporting. So we see this in the more older person who's, I uh, have several clients like this, who's just their testosterone have dropped, their insulin's not very good, their hormones are not supporting their brain cells. They have APO4 positive, the gene uh, that's a high risk for Alzheimer's. And things are just sort of withdrawing and the brain cells aren't being supported. Type um, 1.5 is this mix. We call it sweet. This is the person that's maybe overweight, pre-diabetic, has high insulin levels. And type 3 is very interesting. And we believe it's even 10% of all Alzheimer's may be type 3. They present differently. They're younger. And it's a response, an inflammatory response to a range of things, but usually either molds or Lyme disease or heavy metals, mercury and lead especially. But they have to have a gene that we can measure. 25% uh, of the population have this, this haplotype. And if you don't have it, you will never get uh, this type three. But if you do have it and you're exposed to these molds or infections or mercury, uh, and this is often the hardest to treat, but uh, we are having some success with it. Type four is vascular, and people will often have heart disease or peripheral vascular disease. It's definitely have signs of vascular disease, and they, the small vessels in their brain are being narrowed. But it's not that clear cut. A lot uh, of the science that it's emerging is, you know, people with Alzheimer's, their perfusion of their brain is shut down. So. It's, we often see this mixed picture and people with vascular, so-called vascular dementia, they're diagnosed. When you look at their brains after, uh, after death, they have Alzheimer's. A lot of them have Alzheimer's, these amyloids. So it's not clear cut. A lot of these people have mixed. And then there's the traumatic, uh, the, the boxes and the people with, and we're going to see a lot more of this in, in my country, New Zealand, there's big news with our all, old All Blacks getting dementia. And um, we think that we can prevent and even treat some of this much more effectively than we are doing now. Let's have a look at uh, what I've just said, explained through a video that's on the Dr. Bredesen's uh, website on his Facebook, but it'll help you just confirm some of these and, and do a video of what's going on. Of the over 318 million people in the United States, 45 million are expected to develop Alzheimer's disease during their lifetimes. MPI Cognition is the first to use a transformational protocol to reverse cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease and its precursors. 
Healthcare is currently undergoing a transformation from 20th century medicine to 21st century medicine. 20th century medicine relies on small data sets for traditional diagnoses, which do not answer the question of why the illness is present. This one-size-fits-all approach has been thus far unsuccessful in treating chronic illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease. This brings us to the transition to 21st century medicine, which uses large data sets for diagnoses and helps identify changes in the network of the human body that characterize chronic illness. We can reveal the why for each individual and address the cause of each condition in a comprehensive, personalized, and pragmatic way. This transition combines the best of Western medicine and Eastern medicine practices. Using the 21st century approach, we have found that treating Alzheimer's is analogous to repairing a roof with 45 holes. Treating the disease requires addressing many aspects of the body at one time, as you would when repairing holes in a roof. The more holes you cover, the more success you will have at fixing the problem. The current pharmacological approach is focused on developing a drug to combat Alzheimer's. If we were to create a single drug specific to Alzheimer's, it would have to perform so many different functions that it would be unlike any drug ever developed. While the single pill approach may not be a viable option, by knowing the characteristics of the disease, we can address the underlying problem and patch 45 factors, or holes as we referred to them in our earlier analogy. This approach is the cornerstone of the Bredesen Protocol. To understand the problem of Alzheimer's and why neurons in the brain degenerate, we need to look at it from a cellular level. Higher organisms rely on four developmental processes. Proliferation, differentiation, migration, and integration. We also rely on these processes for the repair and regeneration of cells such as neurons. This cyclic routine creates a lifelong need for balance among these processes. When this balance is disturbed, it can result in the development of diseases such as cancer or Alzheimer's. In cancer's case, an imbalance towards an increase in the proliferation and survival against programmed cell death leads to the development and spread of cancer cells in the body. On the other hand, Alzheimer's occurs when there is an imbalance in the migration and integration processes that are critically involved in plasticity, a term that refers to change in the brain, such as the making and breaking of connections between neurons. These connections are referred to as synapses. The amplification of Alzheimer's occurs at the molecular species level in the form of prionic loops, which are created by the interaction of various molecules with amyloid precursor protein, or APP. Genetic and biochemical studies have revealed that APP is central to Alzheimer's disease. APP acts as a mediator in the formation of synaptic connections and in synaptic organization. In Alzheimer's, there is an imbalance among these two factors, which results in a greater synaptoclastic activity than synaptoblastic activity. That is to say, there is more breakdown occurring in a synapse through neural retraction and synaptic reorganization than there is formation, which results in an overall degeneration within the synapses. We have discovered that if you cleave APP, we can recognize four peptides that mediate neurite retraction, caspase activation, and synaptic reorganization. As we mentioned before, these processes are associated with Alzheimer's disease and can result in degeneration within the synapses. If APP is cleaved alternatively, we can identify the two peptides that mediate the opposite effects, which are neurite extension, the inhibition of apoptosis, which is a form of programmed cell death, and synaptic maintenance. By recognizing these peptides, we can identify all of the risk factors that contribute to Alzheimer's in our roof with 45 holes analogy, whether they be hormonal, traumatic, metabolic, or some other form of abnormality. Interacting with and covering many of the factors we have identified thus far leads to unprecedented results. For example, over the course of two years, a 71-year-old participant of the Bredesen Protocol has increased his verbal learning test score from less than the 5th percentile to greater than the 80th percentile.
His auditory delayed memory score also saw significant improvement. It went from less than the 15th percentile to greater than the 75th percentile, and the list goes on. The combination of large data sets, genetic data, the underlying biochemistry, and the concept of 21st century health has contributed to the formation of the Bredesen Protocol, the first proven method to reverse the effects of early Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so let, let's have a look um, at the current statistics from Dale Bredesen. Um, he just emailed me last week. So I don't know what that, we've got a green. <laughs> okay, so we've got at least 200 people on the Bredesen protocol. Um, we don't know how many of, we're still communicating about how many we've got from the practitioners, but Dale's got at least 240 now. And so someone's drawing on, we're going to have to. <laughs> okay, so look, here are the basic results. Subject of SCI is subject of cognitive impairment, and MCI is mild cognitive impairment. These are the precursors to Alzheimer's. And if people are compliant on the program, Dale is saying that 100% of these people will improve. So that's quite extraordinary. When it gets to early Alzheimer's, his term is a strong majority, but somewhere between 50 and 88% of people will respond. That's documented improvements. They feel better, their memory's better, and we can document that on cognitive scores. So that's conservative. We, we're still putting this all together and uh, we're gonna publish a paper in the near future. Um, we are seeing some people respond in mid to late Alzheimer's. And I will share a case with you, uh, one of my cases, uh, patients who has mid Alzheimer's, who's responding very well. Obviously, complying to this program is quite difficult for some people if they are more advanced than late Alzheimer's. And what's really clear is the sooner we get this and the younger people are, the better they respond and the healthier they are. If they don't have other you know, conditions like heart disease, diabetes. So these people respond best. The inflammatory type, if we can identify the underlying cause of inflammation and fix that, they seem to respond well as well. So let's have a look at the case studies. Um, now, these are MPI case videos now. I am on the slippery slope and I'm going downhill like a train out of a station without brakes. There's no stopping it. I am losing my mind. I am losing my memory. I am becoming what my mother was like. I used to have to write notes to myself about which side of the road to drive on. I actually had a sticky at one point that told me I needed to drive on the right side, walk on the left. <laughs> I mean, I needed, I, I needed that kind of help. I signed up for an online uh, brain training tool called Lumosity. I was in the 30th percentile for my age group. While I was on the phone, I would all of a sudden start getting headaches. And at the same time, I started to have a hard time remembering people's names. I didn't say, oh my goodness, facial blindness is a problem. I need to go and see someone and do something about it. I just was like, wow, facial blindness is a problem. How am I going to remember this person? Oh, they have three ear earrings in the left ear or the right ear, right? I'm going to, like I do it that way, right? I would find something quirky about the person and try to remember them that way. I'm going to plan this out. I'm going to see how much longer I'm going to be functional, and then I am going to make a plan to basically end my life. I sought out the best neurologist in my area. You know what he said to me? He said, good luck with that. My neurologist was telling me to 
um, go to the psychiatrist, take this medication he was prescribing, Lamictal, and um, see him in six months, basically. When the results came in and they told me that I had APOE4, honestly, I was completely shocked. Even though my dad has dementia, I just didn't think that I had it. I mentioned it to a very old friend. She recommended that I see a doctor who was doing significant research, she said. I had no idea that I was actually patient zero. A member of our website posted a link to Dr. Bredesen's paper, and uh, Dr. Bredesen himself very kindly offered to look at my biomarkers. I heard about Dr. Bredesen, interestingly enough, from my neurologist. My sister-in-law sent me Dr. Bredesen's paper. I read it and decided I have to follow this protocol and I've got nothing to lose. I do know which wall the light switch is on now. I do call my pets by the correct name. I do get in my car and drive like a maniac across country or wherever I want to go. And I don't get lost and I don't use my GPS most of the time because I'm irritated by the woman's voice. And when I first started having symptoms, I backed off my work. I couldn't perform. I couldn't, I couldn't write a grocery list, let alone write a complex report and evaluation. There was no way I could do that. I noticed uh, recently on an assignment that was extremely uh, stressful, long hours, seven days a week, I was working with three or four people who were half my age in their mid-30s. And they were napping, they were getting sick, they weren't co you know, coming to work, and they were asking me, well, what's my secret? What am I doing? I feel so much better now than I did a year ago than I did three and a half years ago. It's a night and day difference. My scores rose from the mid-30th percentile to the high 90th percentile. I was seeing scores of 98.9 to 99.9. I felt amazing. I landed yesterday at a major international airport in San Francisco and drove an hour to be here with you today, and that was no problem. I no longer need a sticky to tell me which side of the road to drive on. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm doing terrific. My memory recall on names is is much better. Uh, when I play poker, I'm able to recall the situations focus better. At work, I'm a little sharper. I lost some of my sexual desires and that's bounced back. I feel like it's uh, more towards the normal side of what was happening before. Um, I'm happier. I sleep better. Uh, my relationship with my wife is improved. I went to Parents' Day at my kid's school and it was a completely different experience. I actually had a really good time. And I was seeing people that I hadn't seen in years who had just transferred to the school and with their kids and I knew their names and everyone's names and I felt confident to engage in conversation and talk to them. Two of the languages I learned when I was younger were Russian and Chinese. And I knew I'd completely forgotten them because I didn't use them. I have no use for either language and as far as I was concerned, they were gone. Very strangely, all of a sudden one day, like all this Russian started coming back. It was really weird. And I was so excited about it that I just started to write every word that was coming into my mind. And it was, it's strange, it's like the channel opened up. And the same is happening with Chinese. This fall, I had to um, type something up and I went so fast, like I used to, it was shocking to me. They redid the cognitive testing, the same couple hours testing battery. And this time, he looked at that and he said, based on this, I'm gonna say now that you were in early cognitive decline before, but now you're completely resolved. Um, this is a case of Professor Bredesen's. Now, a lot of you know about APOE4, so this is a gene, 25% of the population have one and 2% of the population have two copies, he's got one copy. Just to emphasize, this is a little doctor, a genius who went to Berkeley at the age of 16, um, who's, these are the perturbations we were talking about. So you see his fasting insulin, we like it at around four or five, 
and it's at 32 at the baseline when you came to see bredesen. This is a HSCRP is a measure of inflammation, that's very high. I'm not gonna go through all these, just the homocysteine, vitamin D, all these are high, but look after 10 months of the program, how they've all improved. He was struggling, and what's really important to know about this um, from an evidence point of view is that the MRI, the hippocampus is the area that's usually first affected. It's the memory center um, deep in the brain. And for a genius, you'd expect it to be about 90th percentile. So the volume of the brain center is a reflection of how many brain synapses there are, brain cells communicating, one brain cell communicating to another. And after 10 months of the program, it's grown to the 75th percentile. Now, the neuroradiologist called Dale and said, I simply have never seen this in my career. I've done tens of thousands of MR scans, never seen this. And he actually suggested to Dale that they put the 35th percentile. He was suggesting he actually lied on the report because his mind couldn't accept that this was possible. So they sent it to another lab and that this confirmed these huge changes were very, very real. So what that means is this program, for a lot of people, can actually grow brain cell connections. And that's, at the cellular level, that's how it's working. So now I wanna share a case of a, a mid-stage Alzheimer's, uh, a patient of mine, a lovely uh, lady, uh, Meg, She's a 66-year-old female. You see she's got two copies, APOE44. 2% of the population have this. And depending on what study you read, between 50 and 90% of people with this genetic makeup will develop Alzheimer's. Um, her mother uh, had dementia, and she describes a lifelong, um, lifelong memory issues. And we know that even cognitive scores at children with double APO4 are different. So this thing's a lifelong issue and it gives us an opportunity to intervene early. She uh, has hormonal issues. So she had very young menopause, had a hysterectomy. She has also hypothyroidism. These are the risk factors and low blood pressure. She's not getting blood to the brain. She's had migraine, which is relevant. One of these perturbations to her vascular um, blood supply of her brain cells. She's also got gut issues and we see this Every client of mine, I don't have one yet that doesn't have a positive, we call it intestinal permeability or leaky gut, they all have it. And that gives inflammatory um, through the gut. It gets inflammation, food particles, bacteria get in there. A lot of us have this, we have a sort of low grade inflammation. But if you're vulnerable to Alzheimer's, and that's one of the reasons and one of the things that's aggravating the factor. She has autoimmune disease, rosacea, which is a high, if you have rosacea, it's a flushing skin condition, you're at increased chance of Alzheimer's. Um, so when we did her perturbations, you can see she's got irritable bowel, uh, that's much better now. Her homocysteine, which is one of the things that kills brain cells, she's, hers was quite high. The copper zinc, People with APO4 don't reabsorb zinc. All my clients have low zinc, and it's the copper-zinc ratio. This is well proven, and there's professors who do nothing but study the damage that copper can cause brain cells. But you, so it's the ratio. Zinc helps to counter the effects of copper in the brain. So that's improving. It's not as good as we want to do, but uh, we'll keep working and we'll get that better. This is a th the active thyroid hormone, T3. It wasn't as good as we wanted, so we changed her to natural. She was on synthetic uh, thyroid hormone. We changed her to natural um, thyroid, and she got an immediate lift, and her hormones have improved. She's also got low pregnenolone, and we even put her on testosterone, which was normal, and she had very low estrogen. And even though she's 66, well past menopause, we uh, her GP actually before... I became involved, had tried her on estrogen, and she had an immediate response. So she's type two, this atrophic, she's hormone. It seems that um, a lot of her Alzheimer's is her genetic makeup plus this with withdrawal of the hormonal support of the brain cells. Um, so let's just look at her timeline because it's very relevant. 
she in 2010 started having memory life her whole life had memory issues but it was really affecting her work and she was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment in 2013. there's our window that three years family members uh consistently and there was a research on this say there's something wrong with their uh with their loved one three or four years before the diagnosis and we've got to start taking this very seriously and doing more sophisticated testing. That's our opportunity to intervene early and get the best results. But as you're seeing uh, with Meg, she was diagnosed that the disease progressed. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in June. Um, her GP put her on hormone replacement therapy and she just generally felt better on that. Um, her, her partner, Dorothea, discovered the Bredesen protocol, got a naturopath involved, and there was some improvement in, in uh, energy, but no real improvement in her cognitive function. Then we got involved in October, and uh, quite quickly she started feeling better, but in 2017, April, we documented improvement in cognitive scores. Definitely she's feeling better, she's definitely quite cheeky, and her partner just went away and left her on, alone, on her own for the first time in 17, uh, seven years, so there you are. Um, she now tells everyone she only has mild dementia. And uh, let's just see how significant this is. So this is a, a research from a neurology magazine. This is what happens, the progression of Alzheimer's. If you are APO4 negative, the decline in your cognition over the years is one way, but if you have APO4 positive, you have a steeper curve down. So you'd expect a worse prognosis when you have the APO4 gene. So this is even more extraordinary that we've managed to turn around um, mixed cognition in a relatively short period of time on these protocols. And let's just show you what we documented. This is her online CNS vital signs. This is a cognitive test, well validated, internationally recognized and accepted, used in research. And this is her six months later after on the Bredesen protocol. Now look at the neurocognitive index. That's like an IQ test. That's like a summary of all the other tests below. Beforehand it was two and now it's the sixth percentile. That is a very dramatic change, okay? So most people would be in the, you'd expect her, she's actually got a degree. She, if she didn't develop it, you know, perhaps in the 60th percentile. So she dropped right down to the second percentile. Um, and now it's turning around. And specifically, look at what's happened to these parts of her cognition, her attention, her flexibility, her ability to pay attention, have not just skipped one, she's gone from very low to low average. And her simple attention has improved as well. So this is unprecedented. I don't know of anyone with mid-stage Alzheimer's uh, in New Zealand um, that has had this documented. So you see these things, the actual scores, complex attention, one to 14, flexibility, one to nine, executive function, one to nine. The executive function, that's her ability to reason, to plan, and to think. And in real life, that's what we're seeing. Meg now gets up and runs her own show. She has a tick box, check box we created for her. She does her exercise, she takes her coconut oil, she makes her brain smoothie. She's, she's running her own life now. And like I said, she's been left alone. So her ability to pay attention has dramatically improved. Look at that, 23 to 70. So this is Meg, she's on her exercise and she's out there uh, with her partner enjoying life. And I think that's one of the, when people approach us and they go, well, they've got mid-stage Alzheimer's, do you think we should do the program? And I look at the person and ask them, you know, if you have a good quality of life and you want to maintain it, then this is the best therapeutic program. We don't know the results until we try it. Um, now, another case is uh, Roy. This is another case of mine, 75 year old man, again, APO4 positive, family history. He had sleep apnea. Now, a lot of people have sleep apnea that don't know that they've got it. And we need our partners to be very, very careful. If you're a loud snorer 
and you're developing cognitive issues, you should go and get tested for sleep apnea. Um, he also uh, has infections and hypothyroidism. Uh, he's also got vascular issues. He needs a pacemaker and he's got low blood pressure, meaning he's not getting enough you need. There's been a big study about you shouldn't drop people's blood pressure too low. I think that's a mistake being uh, happening because you need that pressure to pump blood into the brain and give people oxygen. He again has got this leaky gut and he's had uh, previous bipolar disorder, which is a, is a risk. Um, you look at his perturbations, we, uh, he's inflamed, we've improved that. Now we're getting onto the challenge. This homocysteine is very high. We like it less than seven. And we just tried to retest it, but got told by the lab that the new rule is only pathologists or specialists can prescribe this now because in New Zealand, they're trying to save money on tests. So we will get it done in a private lab, but this is highlighting one of the changes that uh, have occurred and we, we, is the challenges is to get these tests done. So the copper zinc ratio has actually got worse. So now I need to work with him. He's probably got a lot of copper in his pipes. They, I know they live in an old house and we're gonna have to put a water filter in there and probably chelate some of that copper out of the system. His vitamin D, again, very common. We like it 125. It was terrible. He probably had a low vitamin D for his whole life. And this, along with the gene, has uh, been an aggravating factor for his Alzheimer's. He's also got low hormones, and we're starting him on testosterone. But his hemoglobin's improved as well. Um, so look at Roy's timeline. He's got a memory loss of uh, seven to eight years. Vasculitis, which is the inflammation of the blood vessels, including the brain, contributed to his Alzheimer's. He was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment slash Alzheimer's in 2015, referred to Alzheimer's Association. And uh, he was started on the CERT food diet, which is a diet which is to increase, increase certain pathways called the sirtuin pathways, which are involved in inflammation in the brain and aging. But it's a lot of the good foods, the blueberries, it's the cacao. Um, we won't get into the details, but he's noticed some improvement in energy. And then um, his wife noticed the paper with Bredesen and uh, they came to us. We started them on the program and quite quickly, actually, Roy noticed an improvement. And he, his wife, uh, in a beautiful comment, says, I have my husband back. And within six months, he's documented a reversal. And we'll have a look at that now. This is Brain HQ. If you're doing brain training, don't do any other brain training but Brain HQ. It's the only one that has been proven in studies to have a significant impact on preventing dementia, but we're using it to help reverse dementia. So Roy, look what happened to Roy's test scores. They've improved. Those in the box are the percentile gains he's had in just the small six months of training. He's been very compliant, very good at doing his brain training. And this is extraordinary. So you've got someone with MCI slash Alzheimer's who's on the 71st percentile. Now you just don't see that. That means, you know, so he's above average for his age. Someone who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's and cognitive scoring. So this is really strong evidence that this program's working. Hi, I'm Trish. Roy was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2015. So we had always started using the coconut oil and what we could off the Bredesen program, which we had seen on the computer. So since he started the program properly in October, there have been huge improvements. Um, so much so, in fact, that I treat him like an ordinary ordinary person now and um, not like somebody who's ill at all. He got quite depressed at one stage and angry with what was happening to him but now I see my lovely husband once again. So it's just wonderful and thank you to Dave for bringing this program to New Zealand. Thank you. Morning. I'm Roy, subject of the, this program. 
and I find it very hard to believe how much improvement I've made since being on this program. I feel great, I feel optimistic, and looking forward to the future. These things were not possible a year ago. I just wanted to fade away and not think about anything. But now I'm looking forward to things, and thank you very much, Dave, for having us on this program. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm a Community Advisor for Alzheimer's Northland. I have the great privilege to have Roy as one of my clients and I've seen the change since he's been on the program and it's been phenomenal for me. I've never ever seen anyone with dementia ever get better. So great belief in what you do. So let's talk about what this therapeutic program is. And it's really important and we struggle sometimes with our working with our doctors the patients, GPs, that we've got to get this idea that it's not about just normalizing your perturbations. Let's take vitamin D or B12. B12 is a good example. There's a huge range of so-called normal between 220 and 500. That's the normal range for a B12. But we've documented cases of people dying with a B12 of 250. They, if you've got cognitive decline, you need your B12 at 500. No questions asked, even up to eight, 900. So that's an example. We have to optimize your, all these things, not just normalize your hormones, your zinc, your vitamin D. All of these things have to be optimized. And there is a lot of juggling and looking at things and testing. But um, that's how the programs work, by optimizing them and getting these brain cells to move together instead of being pulled apart. The nutrition is probably about half of it. There are lots of foods that we're now learning aren't just calories and vitamins and proteins. They are signaling molecules to genes. Broccoli and broccoli sprouts is an example. We know that turns on an anti-inflammatory pathway. They signal to our genes and we're going to see a lot more about this, but we don't just pe put people on the Mediterranean diet or the Mayan diet. We put them on, and it changes because new research comes on a diet with all these little molecules that are being shown to improve cognition, to reduce inflammation. So we optimize that, and it's different for everybody. If you've got high sugar levels, you've got to have less uh, fruit. But if your sugar levels and insulin levels are normal, then maybe you can have that sweet potato. So it is personalized program. Supplements play a huge um, component. It's interesting that some supplements that have been used in Ayurvedic medicine for 5,000 years for memory loss are now being shown to have an effect. Things like ashwagandha um, and bacopa, these things are being shown in small trials, but there's never enough money to do the really large random control trials because they're not painted in drugs. Um, autophagy is a really important concept. This autophagy means self-eating, the way we clear out our dead and dying cells. And by having an early meal and going to bed three hours after the last mouthful, you stimulate your um, own autophagy systems. And by fasting, by having at least 12 hours, we try and stretch people to 16 to 18 hours from dinner to the next meal. We, can, we know this for sure that that turns on our brain's ability to clear this amyloid beta. So sleep and fasting are important. There's certain types of exercise, I think, that are mixing types of exercises that are optimal, not just going for a walk. If that's all you can do, well, that's fine. But um, we, there are certain, you know, weightlifting, for example, resistance training is really important to put in the mix with your walking and jogging and other sport. And yoga, balancing, stressing your brain to um, orientate itself, getting your head below your heart so that the reflex causes blood to run to the brain. There's all these little tricks and tips that are part of the program. Brain training we've talked about, but there's also these new neuromodulation. And dancing turns out to be one of the most important things. I've got, I uh, had a big Skype with a client and uh, they're uh, rock and roll dancing. And I was pleased to see that because this constant moving and adjusting turns on the brain like no other um, training. So have some fun with your brain training and your and stimulating. 
Um, specialized coaching, there's no doubt we're going to need not just health coaches, but health coaches really well trained and versed in helping people. People need lots of support. They deserve it and they need it. And one of the challenges moving forward is, is how to actually provide people with that support. The key thing is this is not a stop start program. You don't give it and I've given the program and then it's over. We're constantly changing the program. The first clients on the Bredesen Protocol are now five years in and they're doing well, but they're not stopping. They're constantly looking for little improvements in their program and the science is, is really booming and it's gonna give us much more tips and skills to be able to help people moving forward. Now, it's not just Dale Bredesen that is showing that a multi-domain, using exercise, diet, brain training, these multiple interventions is having effect on cognition. The finger study, which is a very well uh, accepted, a great reputation, is a great piece of science. It's a long-term uh, study, showed a 25% difference between the people who were doing brain training, had a good diet and did some exercise, 25 five percent difference between the control group that more or less ha just had some advice and uh, that's a huge change in different cognitive scores that was after two years so they've now that program is going to be expanded there's just been a 20 million dollar grant to expand that and that's very encouraging and i and it's being accepted now the lancet's a very well established um, journal and to publish that you know it's very hard to get anything into the lancet so Hopefully, moving forward, we will see the results coming from this. So let's just talk about the challenges um, in science and medicine. We've got, Dale tried to get a controlled trial of these protocols in Australia in 2004, and was told that you don't understand trials. And he said, well, you don't understand Alzheimer's because the trial ethical board who turned down his uh, request for a trial said, we're just looking for a single thing that we can measure versus and you know which is a drug or a surgical procedure versus a control group the brain and our body and our biological systems just don't work like that so this is a kind of flawed mindset which we're going to have to find ways to overcome and of course there are no there's not a lot of research money for anything that's not a drug you know um, who's going to fund a research and so that's that's a real problem the lack of controlled trials, uh, cases are one thing, but we really need this controlled trial to, to proceed. And the challenge in, is getting these testing done in New Zealand. It's easier in America and other parts of the world, but in Australia and New Zealand, it's real problems. Um, so the solutions for this is we, we just got to keep documenting cases and we need the media to start and groups like DAI to start getting in behind this and like Kate has been doing, lobbying to at least get people to look at these cases that are reversing and to look at the science. This is, this is not just random chance, this is solid science. We understand why people are reversing because of Dale and other people's work and uh, understanding why brain cells are dying in Alzheimer's. The, there are trials planned and we hope to be part of those in Australia. And we need to obviously train a lot more doctors and laboratories. The challenges are the costs. The package put together, I don't think we need all of this, but there is a package put together from Nutripath in Australia, $5,000 just for the tests. Um, we don't use that package, but um, we, you could if you wanted to be absolutely sure you're covering every base. It takes a lot of time. And uh, we are developing an online program to reduce that time. But um, then there's the cost of supplements. We work with a very good company who is a non-profit supplement company uh, called Cytoplan. And Dale's tested their supplements independent of them. And we can be sure that they're the best quality. But they cost. And it depends on how many perturbations and how many supplements you need. But usually it may be up to $50 to $60, $70 a week. On, on supplements. And then there's the challenge of these multiple behavior changes. People, most people have to change their lifestyle very significantly. And it puts a lot of burden on the patient, on the person themselves, but also on their caregiving. And there's no doubt that the people who are doing best on this program have 
the great support from their loving partners, their family, and their practitioners. And that's an essential critical success factor. So the solutions are obviously, um, Mickey and I are developing an online brain optimization course that will be available sometime in the near future. We have most of the content, but we have to put it together and online. So people won't even, it's a, in order to replace a coach, if they can't afford one, they'll be able just to do this brain optimization course that will walk them through all the different uh, problems they're gonna face, the challenges, and how to overcome them. What do you do if your copper zinc isn't coming down, um, like as in the case in Roy? How do you uh, approach your GP and what information do you give them? What links do you give them to convince them to help you get that home assisting done, uh, even though the lab's saying that you, you, know, you, shouldn't, you don't need it done? So all these things will be in our course that will be able to support the caregiver and the person themselves. Um, we've obviously got a huge uh, task ahead of us, assuming the controlled trials go ahead and we show the significant improvement. There are going to be cost savings from scale and uh, we can certainly look forward to the cost coming down, I believe. And it won't be until the government gets involved. The government spends billions of dollars subsidizing blood tests and drugs. And when that happens, eventually, um, we will see significant improvements. The American figures are that a case of Alzheimer's from diagnosis to grave costs the family, the person, and the government around three quarters of a million dollars. Um, we estimate that this Bredesen protocol could be done for about $30,000. So I think we're going to get the government's uh, attention when we talk about economics. Unfortunately, rather than people, it might be that combination that finally gets their attention. So the future vision, just to share with you, we do have a four to 500 person control trial. Uh, it's being delayed for, uh, we'd rather have it up and running by now, but again, we're coming up against this mindset, this ethical approval, but I'm sure it will go ahead. Ahead, Dale's lab, the Cleveland Clinic, a very prestigious clinic in America, the UK, and uh, I will be involved with a professor in Australia and doing these controlled trials. I just heard that the government of California is looking at funding a thousand person trial because they said to Dale, the costs for us are going to triple in three years for Alzheimer's. So we're seeing that the economic impact of Alzheimer's is motivating governments to support the trial. Uh, Dale has just reached out to the practitioners, myself included, to present some of the uh, cases of reversal. And we are now working, I don't know when it will be published, but I'm pretty sure it will be, uh, up at least 50 cases of Alzheimer's reversing um, on these protocols. So hopefully we'll have that and we'll be able to use that to try and convince our colleagues and to get more support for this program. There's some very exciting new supplements and drugs and tools like lights and things coming. So technology is definitely uh, working in our favor. And um, I won't go into the details, but I'm just starting my clients on a new supplement, which is looking extremely exciting. Um, the real wins are going to come from not just having your colonoscopy at the age of 50, but having a cognoscopy. Having an online brain test done and tracking it. And as soon as you start slipping more than you'd expect with normal aging, we're, we're going to be able to go, your GP is going to go, hey, your cognoscopy is showing that something's going wrong. Let's do these tests. Let's find out why your brain cells are pulling apart and let's fix it now before you get um, Alzheimer's. That's really the future. And um, it's looking very positive from that point of view. And obviously, again, we're coming down to this bigger issue of having to train, you know, if you look at it globally, uh, tens of thousands of doctors and coaches. And um, I think that the evidence is clear. When I run this past my epidemiology uh, friends, they say, look, you don't have a controlled trial, but you have a situation where no one's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's been undiagnosed. This is uh, considered to be 100% decline and in, in the end a fatal disease. And so within that condition, you start seeing reversal, then it is very significant. And 
if you've got 50 documented cases, which we do have, we just haven't put it in a paper yet, uh, you know, this is enough evidence to say that at least this is the best program on offer for anyone with diagnosed with SCI, MCI, or early Alzheimer's. So that's the end of the presentation. This is my partner, Mickey, and we are offering a worldwide service on a shared care, shared care program. Rather than opening a clinic, um, we knew we'd get reversals and have success. We knew that that word would get out, and we knew that we'd have to turn people away. And we just didn't want to do that. We wanted to be able to get GPs involved to be able to do some of the work and help their, their own patients. And so we're now providing that kind of shared care service. And it's not perfect, but it's working really, really well.